Hello and welcome to Chini Vision. This time we're jumping into the time machine back to 1984. A few weeks back we looked at some of the new computers featured in Personal Computer News in 1983. Personal Computer News was a computer magazine that was published weekly in the UK between 1983 and 1985, the peak of home computing, where there was practically a new machine being released every single week. And there were so many in 1984, I decided to split this one into two. So we, first of all, we're going to have a look at the first half of 1984, starting off with the January 21st, 1984 edition number 45. So PCN's already been running for nearly a year. And I want to start off here because look on the front here. We've got an Olivetti portable and we've got the Commodore 64, the SX64, so by beloved by the Futures 8-bit. So uh, that looks like some kind of like the thing, the Epson machine we saw in the other video. So let's scroll through and see what's available. We've got some games there and we've got the contents list of the magazine. And Osborne UK bounces back. Osborne, of course, uh, we're having a lot of computer prop companies were having problems around this time and uh, Osborne Co Computer Corporation is alive and kicking with the announcement of the Osborne PC uh, with a completely new dealer network where well, you remember the Osborne one and machines like that also scrolling through the news pages we've got some QL news and Sir Clive Sinclair's declared war on the business computer market la uh, last week with a 399 pounds oh, the announcement of the QL with a £399, 128K, 32-bit microprocessor. Yeah, it's 8-bit, it's uh, isn't it, really? Um, so here's the announcement of the QL. There, it's interesting. It's not mentioned on the front page of the magazine. Um, it's going to be £399. It comes with an unheard of 128K for that price. Expanded to 640K if you want to. Uh, Winchester Discs available. And they've got some screenshots of the machine working there. It's a long time before it's going to come out, isn't it, really? Or is it? It's not, I suppose it's not that long, but they've they've announced it and it's going to be out, according to Sinclair, very, very soon. But we all know what happened there. So let's go find uh, just the software charts for this week as well. So PCN, of course, published hardware charts. So we can see what's selling, and these were updated. Although the magazine came out every week, I believe these were only updated every few weeks. Top selling machine is the Sinclair Spectrum, followed by the Commodore 64. Third place, the ZX81 is still selling in 1984. And these would have been the Christmas sales as well, because, of course, this is a January edition. So, um, yeah, it would have been the two weeks up to the January, the, I suppose, yeah, just after Christmas, I suppose. Actually, the two weeks up to January the 14th, 1984, so also, I guess, what's been discounted after Christmas, which might, might explain why the ZX81 is so high. The VIC-20 at 5th, the Atari 600 at 6th, and dropping down to the Tandy Color, as reviewed on this channel, right down at number 20, uh, possibly the original version, not the version that I reviewed. Anything else interesting? The Electron is at 18 as well there. That's very interesting. And then the above thousand pounds uh part of the market anything interesting here the apple 3 very expensive 2780 pounds that's a lot of money in 1984 that's at number five and in the games a chat a chart att attic attack is number one Lun Ooh, ultimate doing well number one and number two there it isn't always interesting looking at these charts in the earlier days because they're not dominated by the likes of ocean and us gold as in the later era Scrolling down, and we're going to go find the SX64. And there we go. Look at it. Look at it there. Takeaway micros. Oh, they, they've they lumped in the SX64 with the Olivetti. So rather disingenuous of them. Um, so the Commodore SX64, a portable version of the best-selling 64 with a built-in 5-inch colour monitor. We're trying to arrange a review of the SX64 for this channel Um so uh, hopefully that's going to happen at some stage, uh, not not immediately, but hopefully soon. And uh, sorry for the noise, that's my mouse, which is now underneath my microphone. So I don't know before you're going to pick it up. 
Commodore's portable version of the 64 has been awaited with interest by Commodore enthusiasts for some months. The SX-64 owes much to the trend-setting Osborne Portable. Osborne, of course, collapsed and are back this month. More interestingly, it slots into notable price cap in the current micro lineup, the market region between £500 and £1,000. At £700, the SX should prove a popular choice for people who want a reasonably transportable computer to perform a specific set of chart tasks. In the case of the future is 8-bit, that task is to prop his kitchen door open. Yes, that's right. Uh, when I last visited his house, he was propping open his kitchen door with an SX-64. He owns many of them. Uh, there's the Olivetti as well. It's got a nice display on it, hasn't it, there? And a big old chunky keyboard. Uh, the Olivetti M10 weighs in at £4.3 ounces and uh, uses a Z8 it was an 8000 processor, so it's a true 16 bit micro can, that can address up to one megabyte. Um, and that's a, instead of the industry's firm favourite, the Intel 8088. Um, they don't like the keyboard by the looks of it on the Olivetti. And I think on the SX64, are they going to. Are they? Oh, here we go. They've spread us over several pages with lots of adverts in between. So the SX-64 is basically a conventional Commodore 64 and uh, it's got a standard 5.25 disk drive in there as well. Uh, it also includes its own power supply, which means it's quite heavy. Uh, they're disappointed with the disk drive. Surprise, surprise. This system is supposed to be a professional tool and yet using disk drives like watching paint dry. Uh, well, we all know about the Commodore 64 disk drives and the speed they work at. For the Commodore enthusiast, of course, none of this matters much. They know exactly what they're getting, except for the weight. Yeah, they are quite heavy. Um, uh, with Bundled with the SX-64, you get Easy Writer Word Processing System, which they think is a good package. And the price, okay, price including that is eight nine five. Um, And uh, that's quite, I don't they give the weight in here? I don't think they do. So the SX, they say the SX64 is an attempt to make desktop technology movable. It's a luggable, like when I viewed the PC, I'm sorry, PPC640, it's not a really portable, it's not like a laptop. It's a, a way to take computing with you. I explain, and it, I don't think it has any batteries either, does it? So, um, yeah, it's a luggable, and they seem to quite like it, although um, they say it's, it makes a nice bundle package to buy, but not to carry. Moving across to the 18th of February, and look at this. The Oric, doesn't it look gorgeous? Uh, but is its beauty only skin deep? I like the use of the lipstick. They're lovely cover. They, uh, you got to remember, this magazine came out every single week, and they always put the effort into the cover in the way modern magazines simply don't. Someone had to plan this out and go and photograph it and uh, make it all look good on a weekly schedule. So let's quickly scroll through the... Um, news pages and the Oric is the main lead this week. So, in exclusive interview, PCN Oric Products International has revealed the shape of its micro that will succeed the Atmos, uh, and they've tested it on page 18. Managing Director Barry Muncaster describes the next system in the works as an integrated micro. It will incorporate integral drives, a modem, probably with AutoDAR, and could be based on a Z80. So, is that the now that's he's talking about future. So, hang on, they've just launched the Atmos, and they're already talking about something else. Don't understand. So we'll look at the review of that anyway. Uh, Sinclair is trying to clear up confusion over deliveries of its new QL computer. Surprise, surprise. We're we're what a month after that last edition where they've announced it. So, uh, QL computer will uh, start. It will start first. Deliveries at the end of this month. This does not mean, however, that QLs will necessarily be delivered with the standard 28 delay delivery period. Here comes the Sinclair product delivery slip. It would, the date would just slip back and slip back and slip back. <laughs> oh dear. So you have the spokesman added that if Sinclair does not meet the 28 day delivery period on a given order, the customer has a right to cancel their order and receive a full refund. But that only applies on orders placed with a money order or check. Because basically, Sinclair are made to do that by law. So uh, let's not pretend they're being generous about this. And uh, 
oh, there's controversy over the Spectral Video 318 and 328 systems for the MSX. It's highlighted what could be a fatal weakness in Microsoft's attempt to establish a home computer standard with MSX. Uh, so hang on, we've got a problem with... Ah, now this is the Spectral Video, isn't it? Yes, what basically happened was Spectral Video launched their MSX uh, computers before the MSX standard was finalised and therefore they weren't allowed to have the MSX logos on the machine because they're not 100% compatible, they're 99% compatible, but that wasn't enough to get them the MSX logo. I always wanted to try one of those machines out actually and see just how well it does work with MSX software. So let's scroll through and find the view, or let's look at the views first, um, let's look at the charts first. Spectrum first, Commodore 64 second, VIC 23rd. ZX81 is down to 5th. Um, and the over £1,000 looking pretty much the same as before. The Wang Professional is at number 8. Hunchback number 1 in the charts by Ocean. A Manic Miner in at number 2. Looks like it previously has been number 1. So we got a review of the Oric Atmosphere, a lovely layout here. Look at this. Gorgeous. Right, let's have a look at what they've got to say. Oric have attempted to put old wrongs right. Uh, okay, Oric could not have chosen the worst time to unveil its new Atmos. It would seem a suitable occasion mid-January uh, when everyone... Had, I can't I can't see the black. <laughs> let's zoom in a bit, zoom in a bit more. Or it could not have chosen a worse time to unveil its new Atmos. It must have seemed a suitable occasion mid-January when everyone had reverted from Christmas festivities at the Witch Computer Show where very little else for the micro hobbyist would appear. And then came the Sinclair QL and the Atmos was knocked off the first pages of the micro magazines. Well, also, now, now I'm not a business expert. I don't go on The Apprentice. I'm not Lord Alan Sugar. No. Right, OK. Launching a home computer... Launching it in January, right? When the people buy most computers, Christmas. Surely you launch a new computer at the end of the year, September, October, so people can buy it for Christmas. Not launching it in January when nobody wants a computer. All a bit weird and probably contributed to the death of the Oric. Um, the Oric one, it was, it, oh, hang on, they're talking about the Oric one there. Where's the Oric? Uh, the Atmos has a dashing red and black. Uh, the Oric has a dashing red and black livery with professional keyboard. Even the old Oric logo is restyled with a red go faster stripe. For £169.95, the buyer gets a 48K Atmos, mains connector, TV and cassette din leads, manual and introductory cassette. There are no immediate plans to produce a 16K model for the UK market. And look at the back there. And look at that, all that red. Isn't that lovely? Familiar site for Rorik owners from left uh, TV socket RGB. Oh, that's RGB, does it? Okay. Tape sockets, printer interface, expansion port and power input. I'd like to get an Atmos in for Tunivision, but um, again, budgets and things like that. But if I come across one, I'm going to try and get hold of one. Because look at it, just how lovely they look. When switched on, the Oric identifies itself with a message saying Oric Extended Basic V1.1 and shows how much memory is available. Um, certainly, the new ROM is more honest than the Oric 1, which attempts with the cassette on the other side, wound on. Oh, hang on. Certainly, the new Oric ROM is more honest than that of the Oric 1, which used to claim. 47480 bytes free, totally ignoring those bytes gobbled up by the system variables and the screen display. But again, look at it there, look at how nice it looks. All those red buttons, oh, it just really is really nice. And it's got a uh, puck of discs, not tape cartridges. Again, I don't know what a pucker uh, thing is. Uh, you've, got, you've got those famous uh, explode, ping, shoot, and zap commands on the sound. As well, it all looks very interesting. Uh, specification is £170. It costs £170. Specification Z502A, 48K RAM, 16K ROM, 28 lines of 40 characters on RGB or TV outputs, 200 by 240 pixels. Doesn't say how many colours. 
Uh, I'm just going to be available from Dixon and Nasky's comic, Wigfalls. Wigfalls? We, name I've heard of, I've never been in one of the shops. Rumbelows and various computer stockists. And it, uh, they do say in here, the Atmos sits uneasily at £169 between the Spectrum and Commodore 64, both in price and capabilities. And if you get down further into the magazine, you've got a advert for, and you can't really see it here very well, um, because it's spread over two pages, uh, for the Auric here. So they've taken out four, three pages there. So they've got this 3C, three cures for amnesia. Right, three cures for amnesia. Believe it or not, commuters offer suffer from amnesia, okay? 99% start off with large enough memories, but operating functions like text, color, and some and more particularly high resolution graphics take large bytes out of them, leaving vaguely usable memory for programming and games. Not so the Arc Atmos 48K. This is one home computer that takes all these normal work functions in its stride. Okay, so unlike other home computers, it uses a highly sophisticated serial tribute handling method used by view data and teletext. Okay, so it's basically got some. Uh, clever handling that gives you 37k free out of the 48. Although doesn't what does the Spectrum give you? Doesn't the Spectrum give you something like 42, something like that out of the 48? Yeah, but they, they don't mention the Spectrum though, um, or do they? Uh, so it rivals the performance of the supposedly larger, more expensive Commodore 64, which unfortunately loses 26k of its uh, memory in high resolution graphics. Yeah, it's all a bit relevant, really, isn't it? Because it's not. Um, do they mention the Spectrum at all in this? It beats its immediate competitors like Sinclair Spectrum, Dragon 32K, Vic 20, and Atari 600. Right, okay, apparently it does. Um, so basically, it's all, the entire marketing strategy is based about how much memory it has free. Didn't work, did it? Oh, we've got lots of technical specifications here. Lots of technical specifications. Oh, I've got printer technical. <laughs> put the printer specifications on the left. Ballpoint pen for color. Uh, Atmos specifications. So we've all the stuff we saw earlier. Does it say eight colors? Only two forty by two hundred screen, and uh, three channel sound, eight octaves. Is it an AY? I suspect it's an AY. And if you can hear a small aircraft going off in the background, it's my computer fans, which seem to be struggling a little bit with just opening this stuff up. So I apologise for the noise. <laughs> and look what those peripherals there. That's the printer. There's the computer. And there's the micro disc, which is some proprietary uh, thing. They off 160k per side, 4080 tracks. So is that a proper disc? Possibly. Um, 599 files per side. Forwarding on to April the 14th, 1984. And looky here, what is this? This is the micro key, fourth based with dozens of colors available. And uh, protest inside, look at that. It looks, looks like the Amstrad CPC font, doesn't it? In mode naught. This is going to be interesting. Hmm. Anyway, game prices crash. Game prices are hitting the floors a day of pocket money software dawns. As of last week, Pulse Sonic is selling Commodore and Sinclair games for $2.99. And a new company, Mastertronic, is going even lower at $1.99. At these prices, you probably shouldn't expect too much. So that's the dawn of Mastertronic here in April 1984. Uh, news about the Oric disk drives are apparently... Uh, yeah, then they, looks like they haven't been delivered, but they're going to be delivered shortly so what we're three months on from the launch two months on something like that and uh coleco is uh yeah we looked at the view of the via the coleco adam last time we did one of these videos for 1983 and uh looks like coleco are starting to collapse and for splat there as well um most exciting <laughs> was that entice you to buy a game yeah, but that was a millionaire, a new experience in getting rich. Okay, so incentive are taken out two on the same page. Okay, never tried that. Might review it for Journey Vision one day. Millionaire. Hmm. 
Jet Set Willy is number one. Straight in number one. Fighter Pilot number two. Checkered Flag number three. Manic Miner number four. Bugaboo straight up from 22 to number five. And uh, top computer this month. Oh, Commodore 64 is the top selling micro um, for the previous two weeks up to the April the 5th. Spectrum down. That's very unusual. It's usually the Spectrum. BBC B is up. VIC-20 is down. ZX81, again, bouncing back up again from 9th to 5th. You would have thought that would be on its last legs at the start of 84. But no, it is still selling. It's now down to £40 for a ZX81. So this heavy discounting is probably means why it's in, in the chart. The 800XL at the bottom of the chart there. And the Wang ever present at number 6 in the top 10 over 1,000 computers. We well, want to go and find out this thing on the front cover. Okay, so here we go. Fourth feature. Ted Ball looks at the prospects for a new fourth system. No shots of the computer. Right? Oh, there we go. That is it there. Right. You would have thought they put something on the screen. It runs on 6502, 1430k ROM, 3.5 inch disk drive built in. Interesting. Very early adoption there. So in theory, a computer is a general purpose machine that can, with suitable programming connections to the outside world, be adapted to perform any task we require. In practice, each model comes equipped with a range of programs interface that give it its identity. The Micro Key 4500 does not feature into, fit into any of the usual categories. The hardware and price suggest a business system, but the machine lacks a standard operating system that would allow it to run widely available business programs. Okay, so it comes just with what it looks like is fourth and its own operating system in the ROM, much like a Commodore 64 a Spectrum or a Amstrad don't come with kind of a standard operating system. They come with their own operating systems. And I guess this is what the micro key does. But the clue to the micro key is, of course, the fourth language. Fourth was developed originally for programming applications, including the control of scientific and industrial equipment. It uses a reverse Polish notation, which is a maths thing for maths people who understand these things and the micro keys are ideally suited to its hardware and software for such applications and for use as a technical for using technical education the system is intended for experienced computer users and i think even though we are experienced computer users um i think it's going to be way beyond <laughs> what we could use if you ever came across one of these um let's describe what it does it's got a 640 by 200 display with eight colors available which can be expanded to 16 colors by fitting an additional color card. And in monochrome, it's 1280 by 200. That's that's a weird resolution, isn't it? 200 vertical pixels, 1280 horizontal. Uh, I can make, make up for some weird graphics, but I guess for business applications, that'd be quite good. But just lacking that, uh, just lacking that resolution vertically. And they've got some graphics at the back there showing what goes on there. Two composite video. BBC compatible uh, monitor port, that's cassette as well. The major part of the software is the fourth programming language, which is held partly in ROM and partly on disk. It is the standard fourth 79 with a few extensions. Um, it all looks interesting. Um, it obviously would have sold in tiny, tiny numbers, and even if you came across one of them, you're not going to get any software to to run on the thing. It's one of those just really obscure early 80s micros that it looks like the IBM PS1, uh, is it? That kind of case, but yeah, not really uh, Not really something I think, guess you or I are going to come across. Here we are, April 21st, 1984. Hey presto, it's the Rabbit's new micro, another computer we've nobody has ever heard of. Again, but that's not the reason I chose this month. For uh, eagle eyed viewers can probably already guess. Uh, eagle eyed, it'd have to be eagle eyed just to be there. You go, see, that's why we chose this date because, of course, it was the week of the Amstrad press conference. And just how it is the lead news item, but it's very, very small because at this stage, it's just another computer being launched. Computers are being launched all the time. So, Lookout, Sinclair, Acorn, and all the rest, Amstrad is coming. Better known for its hi-fi units, this British electronics company is about to wade into the home computer scene with a micro that looks very strong on paper. 
Amstrad CPC 464 will appear in the shops in June. It will offer Z88 processor, 64K of RAM, typewriter keyboard, including cursor cluster and numeric keypad, integral cassette drive, and monochrome monitor for, monitor for 299 Opera color monitor instead of a green display, and the price is 329 all in. Added 188K 3 inch micro floppy CPM and digital research is logo language. And you can have the monochrome system for 429 and the color system for 529. Um, the system will be available at Dixon's, Comet, and Mumblows, as well as mail order companies. Um, yeah, and then they go on to about details about screen resolutions and things and, and the quality of the basic. And there were going to be 50 games programs available for launch or along with the utilities. So um, and that's all they've got to say at this stage. I'm trying to have that big press conference, but really it's not that big a news. And they also say at the launch, Amstrad had word store running adequately, if slowly. So and some users may find the slow screen speed and scrolling of the 464 uneasy on the eyes. Well, they've only really seen um, the demo version units that Amstrad had at that big press conference. So um, again, hopefully there'll be a, well, I know there's a review of the system, so we'll come to look at that a bit later on. Uh, chip shortage hits BBC. BBC users wanting to upgrade their disk systems could find their choice restricted by the dearth of the 8271 disk controller. And my Apple Mac is really, uh, that fan's really going for it, isn't it? Right, that, that, that Mac, my my computer is still uh, whirring away. I've improved it very slightly, but I'm going to have to live with it, I'm afraid. So scrolling through here, anything else happening this month? Uh, we've got the sales charts again. Of course, the CPC won't be out. It doesn't come out until June. doesn't really hit the shops till September. So the Commodore 64 again is number one there. And Spectrum down at number two, BBC B at number three, and Electron uh, at number six. And then the NCR decision mate in the uh, over 1,000 computers as well on the Wang ever present and I, I, ne I will never b get bored of saying wang professional 3076 pounds by wang there and the ATT Sirius is number one and the IBM number two and I managed to quieten my computer down for just long enough to look at one final edition for the first half of 1984 the June 16th 1984 edition now this is the edition that has the review of the Amstrad CPC in it but so Clive has managed to usurp the CPC by offering an exclusive interview with an extremely unflattering picture of himself on the cover and his, yeah, his comb over there. Um, yeah. Uh, zoom. Dear me. Dear, dear, dear me. They could have found a more flattering photo of Clive, couldn't they? But Sir Clive answers his QR critics. Hmm. So we just scroll in here, and uh, yeah, we can. CPC is relegated to page twenty-eight. Amstrad's high flyer, um, and but Sir Clive is taking all the glory here on page two. So, um, Sir Clive Sinclair has broken his silence to speak out against his QL critics, claiming his company was better than any other in meeting its promises. <laughs> Yeah, he attacked complaints about QR delivery delays as unfair and damaging. I mean, well, I mean, what's the unfair about it? They were they were late, Clive. As the first machines with the final debug software go out to customers, he contacted PCN in a bid to set the record straight. He made a pledge to his customers: "We are not going to let people down. We will make sure of that." Well, you've already done that, mate. Um. Why, he wondered, would Sinclair take all the stick when Acorn's Electron took a vast amount of time between announcement and volume production? Yeah, but Clive, you said you were going to be delivering them. It's not announcing things, is it? It's actually taking people's money and then not delivering. Um, yeah, he's basically blaming everyone. Well, he's basically saying, oh, everyone else uh, delivered their computers late. The IBM PC was delivered three months late. Um, Commodore still hasn't produced machines it announced last June. But it's not announcing stuff, Clive. It's announcing stuff and taking the money. And that's the whole problem. That's You know, it's it's like these crowdfunders these days, like some very closely related crowdfunders uh, to this particular... <laughs> to to uh, this particular brand. Announce it, 
take the money. Yeah, we were about delivering it a bit later on. Right, so what we've got going on is a double page thing. So Sinclair says, we are a wealthy company. We are not in it to seize people's money. Not well, where are we? 1984, so we you got two years to run. I mean, it's a year before the trouble really hits. We will provide unbeatable quality control and backup service. There are things to criticise, but it has to be seen in perspective. We are better at delivery dates than Aquan, IBM, and Commodore. <laughs> uh, MSX spells danger. MSX is bad for you, uh, says Sir Clive. It will since restrict development and hamper the micro industry. Worse than that, it is definitely not what you want. Now, you definitely don't want an MSX, according to Clive. And he blames retailers promoting this Japanese micro standard based on the Z80 and Microsoft Basics. MSX machines are freezing technology. Standardization is not in the consumer's interest. Oh, dear, Clive. Um, I'm very concerned about the fairly stupid attitude for some British retailers about MSX. They say it's marvellous because there is standardisation, but that's not so marvellous when there is standardisation that's so badly out of date. Well, but hang on, Clive, it's pretty much the same spec as the Spectrum, isn't it? So do you say it's badly out of date, your own machines? Hmm. Uh, oh, on the BBC, they are not going to throw out the BBC machines overnight, but as they replace them, we'll buy new machines. They will go for the QL, partly because it will be the university standard. Hang on, Clive, you don't want standard. Um... What are you saying over there? Any data from there over there? Hmm. Uh, and because it's so much better value. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the writing is on the wall already, isn't it? And the QL is going to take on the world. B- bouncing back from last year's failure to sell the Spectrum under the Timex tag in the US, he is confident the QL will make its mark in over there and in the US and everywhere. We are much concerned to be a worldwide supplier. We are going to back into the US with the QL and we are selling in all European markets with a presence in some 50 countries. Sinclair claims to be a major exporter, untouchable even by Japanese contenders with a record 40% of his turnover in foreign markets. Yeah, but Clive, that, that turnover is basically Spain, isn't it, really? Um, dear me. Oh, dear. Using the Dragon Front as well. There was restrained optimism over the fate of Dragon Data last week as it following its announcement that it had called in the receiver. Well, that's basically doomed, isn't it? I mean, yeah. And 32 and 64 are still selling, although not as well as we would like. I mean, I can't recall seeing it in that soft in that hardware chart, so it's certainly not in the top ten. And there's also problems at computers. There were stormy exchanges last week at the creditors meeting. Control uh, called to discuss the affairs of computers, the maker of the links. Uh, they are 1.8 million pounds, 877,000. This was due to parent company Computers PLC, and they had nine, 94,000 pounds assets. Doomed. Uh, and again, another company going down. Tycom, remember the Tyco microphone I looked at last time in one of these videos? Yeah, they've gone down as well and looking for new owners. Uh, but to reassure the 300 or 400 microfame users, he added, dealers continue to be enthusiastic about the machines. So that gives you an idea of how many systems these guys were selling. That system that got a whole front page of PCN in 1983 sold f- between 300 and 400 units. They aimed to sell 10,000 according to this, but they sold between 300 and 400. And looking at the hardware chart for this week, yeah, the Dragon's nowhere in there. Spectrum's back up to number one. Oric's in at number 10. Uh, well, that's the Oric one, not the Oric Atmos. The Atmos is at number five. Here we go, then. Here's the money shot. Amstrad's Hi-Fi Micro. Old-fashioned, perhaps, but Amstrad's Micro is a very attractive machine, says Max Phillips. Um, and that's, they've got a green screen monitor with that there as well. Just looking, that's the GTM64, isn't it? Yeah, you can see there. I forgot how square those things were compared to the CTMs. It was a cheap, far cheaper design. And it, oh, they've got the welcome tape with the label on the front there saying welcome tape, right? The Amstrad is a fashionably long and slender machine, though it hasn't followed the trend towards diminution. Its design is mature, showing features with the best of the rest and a few of their mistakes. Amstrad is the latest in a long line of electronics big boys to notice that micros are slightly more substantial than skateboards and hula hoops. It started thinking about putting its undoubted manufacturing and design talents towards a home machine. Home machine, for the record, a 6502 improved Vic. Well, we know about the 6502. We're not sure about the Vic bit. Over a year ago, 
The project was replaced by discussions of the great MSX ditch-up, but Amstrad was worried about the MSX spec, the ridiculous hassle of getting an MSX system together, and the fact it made what only competing with 20 or so nearly identical products. So it was only last September that Amstrad Micro really got off the ground. Uh, the machine was it, again a bit of bit of spin on that because we all know the true story of what happened with CPC, and that's kind of accurate, but far more detail in the Amstrad story book. Uh, the machine codename Arnold is more or less a traditional Z80 home-based micro, but Amstrad has learned a lot from everyone else, and the machine is a very mature design with many of the best features of its rivals and almost none of their mistakes. In short, as you might guess, Amstrad has done a, a professional job. The CPC were available in limited quantities. You read this. This is not because, like, unlike some companies, we could name that Amstrad can't build the machine, but the deliberate policy to give the software houses and adult firms a head start before the company really starts selling the products in September. The preview is based on a day's plan with the machine rather than a week of constant use, and you would do well to be wary of the product until Amstrad is shipping it in quantity, uh, because obviously so many different these computers are coming out and people have been burned. Um, of course, Amstrad is all what... Of course, Amstrad is all about what is rather indelicately called cheap hi-fi. With Amstrad, you get tremendous value, but you accept the equipment is not much, perhaps the same quality of bigger names such as Sony and JVC. The same is true of the new machine. Mm, yeah, actually, kind of Amstrad pulled out the stops with this one, didn't they? Um, they didn't put in cheap parts. Uh, the engineers did do a good job. It was built to a price, but they didn't really skimp in the way you can skimp with a hi-fi and put in a cheap volume control and what have you goes into all the oh yeah, i don't need to go into all the display do you but um they do criticize the lack of anti-glare coating on the green screen monitor i mean what do you want for 199 pounds uh the rgb monitor is much more impressive producing bright colors however amstrad has cut corners with the monitor's resolution that admits that the screen can't quite cope with the 464 640 by 280 column display. Yeah, it is a bit of a struggle, but as any Amstrad user knows, if you get the color combination right, uh, such as Protex does with its gray background with black text, actually much easier on the eye. Try and use 80 column mode and the standard CPC colors of royal blue background with yellow text. Do your head in, do your eyes in. It's hard work. Mute those colors down and actually that monitor is much more usable. Rather disappointingly, some micros and some TVs can match the quality of this 80 column display on this dedicated monitor. Completely disagree. Unless you've got an RGB connection on your TV, you're not going to match this via UHF. No way. Um, they also criticise there's some problems uh, with them. I want to say they're reviewing, um, but uh, admit that the monitor could have been knocked about a bit because it's a review version. That's probably true because um, I don't. I've not really seen massive geometry problems on CPC monitors. So to sum up, they say it's a, a easy to use and capable machine that offers tremendous value for money. You get a machine which is on this short analysis more attractive than the first generation of MSX machine. Amstrad also threatens to be big with the system to create a Sinclair Acorn size software add-on market. It has a too big to print estimate of its first year's worldwide sales that make this spectrum look like a failure. In short, it's a great home system if a little late, provided all of Amstrad's claims come true and provided the machines don't fall apart after a month. You see, they're again thinking of the hi-fi problem. Keep an eye on it. It can be a very enjoyable micro to own. And you've got all the uh, specs there, about how much memory you got free, and all the ROM and RAM and stuff, everything. You all know this stuff. It's a CPC. So let's look at the first half of 1984 in personal computing news and just some of the new machines released. And given the length of this video, you can see why I've decided to split this in two. We will, in about six weeks' time, take a look at the second half of 1984. But it's an absolutely fascinating year to see all those new machines being released. And the market settling down after 1983 as well. We're getting all sorts of weird and wonderful things being released as a bit more maturity in the market, companies starting to go under and the dominant forces of Sinclair, Commodore and Amstrad really rising to the fore.